Good evening, and welcome to Inforum at the Commonwealth Club. I'm James Estrin, co-editor of the New York Times Lens Column, and tonight I'm thrilled to be here in conversation with my two guests. Ida Moulinet is a 2018 Catchlight Fellow, a brilliant photographer, and contemporary artist, and the founder and director of Addis Photo Fest. Brent Lewis is my colleague at the New York Times, where he's the business photo editor. He is also the co-founder of Diversify Photo, and is on the advisory board for Catchlight, a collaborator on tonight's program. Shadul Alam, an internationally known Bangladeshi photographer, educator, and human rights advocate, was supposed to be sitting here with us today. That's the chair he would be sitting in. But in early August, he was taken from his home by 30 plains clothes police officers, <clears throat> tortured and put in jail in his hometown of Dhaka. He is still in jail today. He was detained shortly after giving an interview to Al Jazeera and posting a series of live videos on Facebook that criticized the government's violent response to two weeks of student-led protests that began over road safety. Many photojournalists covering the protests, including Shahidul, were attacked by the police and armed gangs. He's been charged under Section 57 of Bangladesh's Information Communications Technology Act, which lets authorities arrest people criticizing the government in social media and online. Over the course of three decades photographing in Bangladesh, Shahadul covered natural disasters, governmental upheavals, the deaths of thousands of garment factory workers, and the struggle against human rights abuses. He has also used his photography to challenge the Bangladeshi government and military on freedom of speech issues and the disappearances of their political opponents. <clears throat> but just as importantly, he has helped to produce generations of Bangladeshi documentarians, as well as building the infrastructure for them to tell their own stories. For 30 years, his Parchala South Asian Media Institute has trained scores of talented photographers and helped Bangladesh gain a reputation for its vibrant photo community. The Chobi Mela Photo Festival, which he started, brings photographers from around the world to Dhaka. The Drick Photo Agency, which he also started, sells stories produced by Bangladeshi photographers to media outlets worldwide. He has also confronted the Western media outlets that he believes holds a virtual monopoly on how countries like Bangladesh are portrayed, or more to the point, misportrayed. Patronizing storytelling, he said, has been damaging to the psyche of Bangladeshis and to the economy. Photos of Bangladesh have been used to propagate a colonial view of the world. And as a result, Bangladesh is only known for poverty and disaster. Shah Abdul knows that poverty is part of his country's story, but when reporting focuses only on that, he says it presents a damaging, narrow view. Rarely, he said, do the Western media or the foreign photographers they assign portray the country's rich culture. He often quotes an African saying which he relates to, which he describes as, until the lions find their storytellers, Stories about hunting will always glorify the hunter. He said, we have to be our own storytellers. We also have to ensure that we are sensitive and respectful of our subjects and that people have dignity in the way that they're portrayed. He was here in San Francisco last year for the Catch Light meeting, and there is more information on him in the lobby, which I encourage you to read. Um, Shahadul was, uh, is a really important figure and uh, in, in 
photography around the world and particularly in the discussion about representation and diverse voices. Uh, he sort of really initiated the conversation almost 30 years ago. And so I think we follow in his footsteps when we have this discussion. And perhaps it's fitting that we're here today with this empty chair because journalism is under attack around the world. In the United States, uh, it's been decried as fake news. But at the same time that we need to defend fact-based journalism, I think we also have to look inside and talk about how we tell visual stories, particularly when the press is under attack, because we have to tell them the best way possible. And that's not something that we always have done, I think it's fair to say. So let's uh, dive right in. Uh, how did you, uh, let's start with Ida. Uh, <laughs> how did you get started in photography? And why do you photograph? <clears throat> but in the meantime... <laughs> 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 when we talk about... Um, Diversity and representation, you know, we're talking about race, we're talking about gender, but we're also talking about class and country of origin and lived experiences, um, ethnic backgrounds. You know, it's all these voices we need to hear. So, again, how did you get started in photography and why do you photograph? So, can you hear me or is it? <laughs> <laughs> Wait, you can go back and put them back on. Yeah. <laughs> can you hear me? Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. All righty. <laughs> um, so I started photography um, at the age of 16 when I was in high school in Calgary, in Canada. Uh, we had like a really amazing art, art class. And there was a dark room in there. So there was a group of students that basically asked, you know, can we learn how to process film? And I think the magic, you know, in the dark room, especially seeing your first print, for me, that was just an amazing experience. Um, but in addition, also, you know, as an Ethiopian and living abroad in the 80s, you know, especially during a difficult time for our country through the famine, um, I understood earlier on that, you know, the stories that my mother would tell me about Ethiopia. And the images that went out to the media just didn't match based on just what we know of the country, you know. So from that, um, the reason I became a photographer was really to address, you know, this is again with what you were saying earlier, you know, it's not about just only showing, you know, the negative part, but to show the complexities of where I come from. So I understood that photography was really a powerful uh, tool that I could share with the world of not only what my country is, but also who I am um, and my background. And how did you employ it? How do you do that? Um, I started out as a photojournalist, and I know some people um, don't know that background. Um, I have like a big respect for photojournalism because that was the foundation of my process. So, um, so over the years, I've always been obsessed about uh, not only just in Ethiopia or in Africa, but also when I look at how uh, people of color are represented in the media. So if you look at, for example, how African Americans are represented in the media, it's almost a similar echo that also exists for the continent. So through that, um, I realized that first and foremost, you know, I had to document these different realities and present that. But more importantly, um, it wasn't just about me, but also you know, how do you develop new talent and support also emerging talents. Hmm. Okay. Um, Brent, how did you get started in photography? And why do you, uh, why are you an <coughs> editor and why do you do what you do? So, my start's funny. Um, originally, I was going to school to be an engineer. That was the goal. I wanted to be the next Bill Gates or Tony Stark. I wanted to be Iron Man. Um, <laughs> 
And so it was the summer of my sophomore year. My grandfather used to carry around this uh, black box shaped camera. This was like 2010. Everyone was using digital at that time. So I'm like, Granddad, why you got this old camera? He was like, boy, go over there, take this camera, take it front of your cousin's house, make a picture. Took it, popped it open, looked over the top. It said Hasselblad. And I was like, what? <laughs> like ran back. I was like, Granddad. This is a hazard blood. He was like, Yeah, I know, I bought it. I was like, <laughs> I was like, what is a black guy from the south side of Chicago doing with the hazard blood? This is crazy. Um, and so basically that gave me the rundown of what he loved to do, and he loved making pictures. And he loved, um, he's really into wedding photography, but he just he wanted to kind of, and I've seen this going through negatives now, like he really wanted to dive into the little documentary work, newspaper, photojournalism, things like that, but you know. He couldn't at the time, so he gave me a camera. I took it back to college with me sophomore year. I was making pictures, and then I wound up getting a job at the student newspaper for what was beer money, basically, I thought, because I still was going to be Tony Stark. I'm still going to be Tony Stark. Um, and it just C++ classes ran away, and I just fell in love with photography, and I was like, journalism, that's the thing I want to do. Um, and I just, I fell in love with it. And I gave that whole Tony Stark dream up um, and went back to rolling dice for soap, but it's fine. And <laughs> I was like, we're not going to get rich here. But I, I knew seeing the photos from the greats, like the Gordon Parkses and the Eli Reeds, I was like, that's what I want to do. I want to tell the story of my people because so much of what I'm seeing is not getting it right. They're just missing it. And that was, you weren't seeing that as much anymore, so I wanted to do that. So, as an editor now, fast forward years later, um, as a photo editor, now I get to do that. And now I get the point where I'm able to match a photographer with an assignment that I think that they might do well in or give them this opportunity that I think they're gonna shine in. And so just having where I'm at now, it just allows me to find people to tell those stories. And if there's no one that, that can tell that story, I know that that's an issue. So I'm going to go find the next generation to build them up to tell those stories in a way that they can see. Because sometimes you just need that inside understanding to get those minute details that some might miss. So you were a photographer for a few years, right? You interned at the Chicago Tribune mm -hmm. and you worked, I think, in Rockford, was it? Rockville, Illinois. Um, well, I was close. <laughs> yeah, it, yeah. and then Chillicothe Gazette. If anyone here knows what the Chillicothe, Chillicothe, Ohio is, okay, I'm not going to say it because hands going up, I don't have enough dollars. Um, <laughs> but, um, and then I was a staff photographer at the Denver Post, which um, was absolutely amazing. And, after, and what went wrong? Why did you become a photo editor? <laughs> I, I wanted to try something. You know, um, this, it was an opportunity popped up at ESPN. It was the, uh, the Undefeated, which was a website dedicated to the intersection of sports, race, and culture, which is the intersection I want to hang out at. <laughs> um, but they're like, you got to be a photo editor. So I was like, okay, let's try it out. And so when I got there, I was just like, I'm going to hire nothing but black photographers. We're going to be the Ebony and Jet of 2016. And I got my list of all my uh, photographers I, I, that I knew that were black and got to like 18 and everybody was in New York City. And uh, I don't have a travel budget. My budget didn't go that far. So, um, so I asked around and got to, got to 30 and I was like, yeah, we're good. And I looked at the list again and everyone was either in... New York or LA. So uh, we had to do more. I knew we had to do better. So um, I don't know if we're going to get here later, but I might as well just we segue will. into it. Okay, we're going to yeah. segue into it later. Uh, okay, yeah, we will. I'm, I'm keep the cat, cat in the bag then. Okay. To be so, continued. <laughs> <laughs> um, Ida, can you describe the uh, Addis Photo Festival you started, as well as the related activities that you're doing in Ethiopia? Uh, building a photography infrastructure and um, trying to build a photography community? <clears throat> so um, I moved back to Ethiopia in 2007 um, and my plan was basically to stay there for three months but it became 11 years. Um, <laughs> so um, you know, when I first arrived in Addis Ababa, the, one of the things that I realized was that there weren't any classes in the art school 
So I started by giving out, you know, just small workshops like weekly. And my idea was to teach um, artists about photography because I figured, you know, the, the relationship would be closer. But over time, um, I also realized that it wasn't just about teaching photographers, but also teaching the community uh, what photography is. And if some of you know the context, like within the continent, a lot of the times uh, the application of photography is based on either wedding photography or studio photography. It's, it tends to be more commercial. And there was really no you know, street photography or even doing uh, journalism work. So through that, uh, we started the festival in 2010, um, and it was just something that, for me, was a very uh, ambitious sort of approach because I felt that in order to shift the mindset of the relationship between photography and society, it wasn't just about us doing the, the work, but also being able to share with the community uh, the different perspectives that exist uh, within you know, a visual language. So through that, um, my main focus wasn't just also about presenting only photography from Africa, but was really looking at the global um, photo industry. So we started out basically uh, as an international photo festival, and uh, we're the first and only for East Africa, and currently we're actually the largest photo festival in the continent. And when I began it, it was really not just about exhibiting, but also you know, doing portfolio reviews, uh, having conferences, uh, engaging in workshops. And over time, it's, um, it's been quite fascinating because that's also how we've been able to find new talent and also being able to inspire uh, new generations of photographers who all of a sudden realize that, wow, you know, when they see an image from across Africa or across the world, you know, you, you get a sense of where the industry is. So, you know, we're featuring photographers from Africa, Middle East, Asia, um, you know, Europe, and North and South America. So through these activities, now we're actually on our fifth edition that we host every two years. Um, it's slowly now becoming sort of the marker also as far as the global photo community. So my main goal was also to promote my country and to show the world that it is possible in Africa that we're doing this kind of an event. And what's been really fascinating is when we have for example, a photographer submitting from the Ukraine, I'm sure that photographer doesn't know Ethiopia at all, you know? But just because this open call has showed up, you know, uh, when they submit, then it's an opportunity for them to learn about Ethiopia and then to realize that there's, there's another side of Africa that they did not expect. So it's been, uh, you know, a very interesting um, sort of event, very challenging, as you know. But at the same time, also, I've learned so much from this experience as well. And can you describe the exhibits, how you curate, maybe some of the photographers you chose and what you're looking for? <clears throat> so um, my main focus is not to be um, like an elitist event. And, you know, there's a lot of different festivals where uh, I sort of miss the point because, you know, it goes back to visual languaging and visual aesthetics. So um, I'm not doing a festival for expats or you know, foreigners or the elite. I'm, I'm basically doing an event for the everyday person to kind of get them into that exhibition and for them to see something that they have not seen. So in the curation process, you know, I make the selection because I'm also in my mind thinking of who is the audience. So even within our marketing, you know, we, we are targeting under 30 um, very specifically. And also uh, we're looking at the stakeholders, which is also the Ethiopian government, mm -hmm. for them to understand that Photography has so many different applications. So within the curation process, you know, I'm not only looking for fine art photography or only journalism. I'm looking at the full spectrum. So the key thing is, you know, we don't do thematics, and I absolutely hate festivals that run on themes because you miss out on amazing work from somewhere else. Um, but the key thing is that, you know, showing work that has can inspire, you know, a photographer on the ground as well, and to also see a different approach of that photographer expressing themselves. And what's the long-term vision that you have um, with the festival and the other workshops that you're teaching? I mean, our, our, I, mean I, I go back to you know, education, which is really the foundation at the end. So my dream is to build an institution, because right now, when you look at the continent, this is the one thing that's lacking for us. So even for you guys, you know, with New York Times or any publication, um, if we don't have an educational institution, you know, that teaches what photography is, then how do we get 
you know, to a, to a level where we are able to compete on the international market. So the first thing is establishing an institution. And the second thing is that I do feel that um, now we're on our fifth edition and the next step is really to start touring across the continent to places that don't have these kind of events. Uh, because when I teach in different parts of Africa, I realize that you know, this kind of event is crucial because it is a motivator for us to also develop new talent. So, um, and through that, even for example, getting into printing, this is also the key component. Because even right now, when you look at the festivals in Africa, we're still printing in Europe at a ridiculous rate, you know? Um, so if we're doing these festivals, then we have to get to a point where we become self-sustainable, meaning that we also have to look at how, you know, uh, we can engage in a way that, you know, printing becomes like that one component. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, Brent, <coughs> let's talk about diversifying. Um, why did you start it? And uh, can, you, can you describe it for us? Okay. But first start with the, the impetus. Okay. Which I cut you off on. Before. You did. You did. It's okay. It's okay. okay. I, I still love you. I still love you. Okay. All right. Now, before I was rudely interrupted. No. <laughs> so fast forward, we're still trying to make the Ebony and Jeff 2016 at ESPN The Undefeated. Um, mm. We found out that I only know 38 black photographers that are based on coast. All right. Now we're here. So... Uh, this was right around, so I was like, where can I go? So I started reaching out to more friends, and we started getting, and it grew, but it still only got to like 58 or so, and I was like, that's still not where I want to be at. I know there's a lot more people out there that I just don't know. So this was right around the time uh, Women Photographs, woo-woo, Danielle Zachman, um, was uh, kicking in the high, like getting ready to have that run up so they actually get released, and we... I kind of talked with her, and we were just kind of going back and forth, and I was like, we just, I just need to do this. So Andrea Wise, who's my co-founder of Diversify Photo, um, we actually just threw it out on social media. We built a Google form uh, and just threw it out there on social media and let it share, and we, we didn't think much of it. We were like, we might get 200, 300 photographers coming through. Okay, whatever, we'll see. Month later, we had 1,500 photographers from across the country, also some sprinkles of across the globe that were people of color that were making pictures day in and day out. So you, you ended up looking for photographers who self-identify as, as, as of color, right? Yes, photographers of color. Okay. So, I mean, that just crosses that gamut. Um, and basically, I think we started setting up the idea of like what we were looking for. And for us... As editors, it was all about making sure that this list, whatever we come up with, because we weren't going to put out the whole 1500, because for us, if an uh, editor out there is going to use Diversify and they're going to hire someone from this, and maybe the assignment doesn't turn out the way they imagined, or maybe that person wasn't that level yet, they're less likely to use the list again. So our Database is completely refined and just has some amazing talent, people of color. We took that 1500, <coughs> brought it down to, we launched with 305. Um, and I just want to do a special shout out to Elijah St. Clair Walker, Jahan Jalen, Jen Samuel, stop, uh, Jesse Winder, um, oh God, Elizabeth Chris, Dudley Brooks, and Michael Wichita, because those people along with Andrew and myself are the ones that took that 1500 and put it into the 305 that we launched with. And so what the site really is for is for all those times that a photo editor, that we see a photo pop up in, let's just say Chicago, because I have a beef to pick with the New York Times. I'm not going to tell anybody what happened. Um, I'm lying. I am. I'm going to tell you right now. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but um, I remember there was this story of Barack Obama. They were doing a story on Barack Obama's upbringing, like where he got his start at. And it was in Roseland neighborhood of Chicago, which is predominantly black, black neighborhood in the south side of Chicago. And I knew this was... I, okay, I'm going to keep this PG. Um, I knew this wasn't the world's best decision, um, but the New York Times hired a photographer to come from the north side of Chicago to the south side of Chicago to photograph Roseland, and he stopped and he went by the corner store that was four blocks up the street from my house and took a picture, hopped back in his car, and went back to the cozy north side of Chicago. 
And it's like, Barack Obama came from here. And it's like, no, I don't think Barack ever went to that corner store, but whatever. <laughs> um, and so for those moments, for every single one of those moments, an editor's like, well, I just don't know a photographer that lives in Chicago who happens to be a black person that lives, that does really good work. I want to be like, here's 305 people. <laughs> There's some amazing photographers of color in here who know these stories that will go further than the corner store and might actually find people. It's amazing. I know it's insane. <laughs> um, and so that's, that's what Diversify really was about, was just doing that and just bringing, also on top of that, making this community of photographers of color who we didn't know each other. One of the fellows, I'm going to shout you out to Brian because you're here and now you're in the front row. I, I never knew Brian Frank. I never knew his work at all. And I found him via Diversify and I just fell in love with Brian's work almost immediately. And then he's also like one of the world's greatest people in the world. So if you don't need Brian, meet Brian. Um, but that's what it's about, just making that community. And now if I need something, I can lean on Brian or I can lean on Carlos or I can just lean on so many other people across the globe and we can all lean on each other to get information. So that's really what secondary was about, was making that community. Okay, so Daniela, who you mentioned, Zalderman, mm -hmm. who started Women Photograph, mm -hmm. um, had a similar motivation of editors saying, I don't know any women who do X, Y, Z in this place, right? Yeah. And so, oh, right, precisely. Uh, and, and so at the same, and so, you know, which between Diversify and, and Women Photograph, I think it's had a, a fairly profound effect in the industry, and I think has, you know, shaken some people to think hard about um, uh, not just who they're assigning, but how people are being represented. Yes. So you joined forces with Women Photograph and with several organizations, yes. including Shah Adul's group, mm -hmm. right? Um, and can you describe what that was about, and also including Everyday Africa? I was going to say Everyday Africa. We are Peter. Um, so basically, it's this um, organization called Reclaim. And so we're just, it's, oh, it, we've grown, because there's been a lot of new initiatives that have popped up that we all think were amazing. But we just wanted to reclaim the narrative that was going on in photography. For too long, we've seen it from one point of view. We've seen the, the history uh, since the beginning of photography has been documented by white men. Sorry, I gotta be brutally honest, that's just how it is. Um, and so every photo that we, majority of the photos we look back on, we've only seen it from one point of view. We've seen history from this one lens. And so we're trying to take that back and it's time that we tell our own stories and people of color tell their own stories. Women tell the stories that are significant and we just, Tank that narrative, and you know, my, my white man, I still love y'all, y'all cool, y'all want peoples, but like, let's, let's get some new voices in this so we can make this a democratic process and we can make this something that we can all be part of because this is our history. This is not just one person looking at the history of other people, this is ours. And so, I'm gonna try it. Save me if I forget one. Um, so, it's Diversify, Women Photograph, Native Photo Agency, Everyday Africa. Um, who else, who else, who else, who else? We just added the Authority Collective in LA, woot woot. Um, Shadul's group. Yeah, Shadul's group, um, which just, so I think that's, I think that's where we're at. That's the six that we have right now. I'm looking, I'm looking for verification. I'm getting nods, we're good, okay. So, uh, but yeah, so all together, we're really just trying to reclaim this narrative that has been going on far too long. And let's bring some new voices into the fold because that's what it's all about, stories, there's stories out there being told that aren't being told in a way that the people who live these stories understand them, and that's a problem. So I shouldn't have, to, I shouldn't look at a story and be like, that's my neighborhood? Oh, I didn't know that's all we did was sell drugs and do drive-bys. Interesting. I'm gonna go to my job. Uh, so. Okay, so uh, Ida, <laughs> the, the, um, the, you know, this is the history of photojournalism in much of Africa is really a colonialist history. Um, the, it is, you know, it is um, Western photographers parachuting in and, you know, for a period of time and making photographs uh, that didn't necessarily cover all aspects of life. 
Uh, did you, um, w what is your critique of that? Um, to me, I, f I feel that um, when we look at the continent, uh, the lens is always, it's like a one-sided lens, which is always what I call the foreign gaze. And through that, um, for example, for those that live outside of Africa, the images that you're bombarded with are often just a one-sided story. And one thing that I've noticed is that, you know, for example, when you come to my country of Ethiopia, um, you know, obviously we have poverty, we have many challenges, but there's also another side to that story. And often a lot of foreign photographers who, you know, come in and document, uh, they're not getting the full story. It's always just the surface of it. And so our main frustration, and, and I think this is, you know, the same globally for even if you look at Middle East, Asia, mm -hmm. you know, all these different places is that um, now we are the generation that is addressing that, but actually putting action to it. And so looking forward, um, a lot of the times is that the international media seems to basically be attracted to purchasing these kind of images or supporting and perpetuating these cliches. Mm -hmm. And these cliches for me are becoming sort of you know, it's getting old and tired, you know, and even over time, most people don't realize that a place like Africa, there's so many complexities within it. You know, sometimes people think Africa is just one country and one culture and uh, one nuance, you know, when it, there's actually so much diversity and so many different things going on there, even contemporary things that are going on. So that always comes back to my question is that, especially when foreign photographers come to our continent, is that uh, there needs to be an accountability and that accountability comes back to is that if we're really photographers and if, we're, if photography is supposed <coughs> to be this democratic tool, is it really a democratic tool? And for those of us on the other side in, in the continent, we find that that has been abused, mm -hmm. you know, because right now, as you know, in the media, what sells is, you know, suffering, war, starvation. There's all these components. And it's almost like there's no other story that's coming out, you know. And this is why I'm there. This is why, you know, even for Brent, you know, this is what we're trying to address is that we have to dig deeper because that's sort of the responsibility that we have is to show, you know, the full image and not just a one-sided. So then some of the problem, it isn't just the photographers taking the pictures, it's the editors, the photo editors, the gatekeepers. I mean, it goes back to the industry. Um, and this is, I think that, that this, this is just a conversation, but when you really look at, you know, you look at how many editors are in, in this position of powers, and who are these editors? That's one issue. And then even when you look at these photo competitions, and you look at who are the judges, that's not diverse. So in the end, it's like one thing is sort of supporting the other, and perpetuating, continuing that cliche. And this is why, you know, somebody like Shah Dule, you know, he made that point in order to sort of uh, contribute to the world and to show that there's a different perspective. So, and this is not something new. This is, this has been going on for generations, you know, but it's just now with this online portal and having, you know, a way to communicate globally, all of a sudden people start noticing that this conversation is coming up to the surface. Yeah. R remember Brent when Shah Dool was at the Portfolio Review and he talked about uh, the a hierarchy of who knows a story. Yep, and so he he said, uh, the person who knows at least is the photo editor who's three thousand miles away. <laughs> you know, the person who then knows at second least is the photographer. Mm -hmm. um, if they're a photographer who's not familiar with the place, then the person who knows it better than them is their fixer. Mm -hmm. But the person who's an expert on the story is the subject. Yes. They yes. know everything about their story, and they're the expert, and that's who you have to um, understand and, and uh, basically be in service of their story. Truly, truly. I mean, that's, and it's weird when you think of it that way, because the editor is the person who has, like, the final say on what really runs, and as an editor myself, I guess, being guilty of this, um, like it's, we don't have direct contact with people being photographed. We don't have the ability to talk to them or we don't take that chance and the opportunity to, to go reach out to them to 
double check the story. Let's have a conversation with them. Let's cut out the middleman of the photographer sometime. Let's go have that conversation with them to make sure that we're telling it right. Or that the photographer has spent enough time in that space to make so we can have a conversation to relay their experience. And so it's it's so weird thinking of it that way because all that onus is on the editor. And so whoever that editor is, which is not a really diverse role in newsrooms across the globe, comes they they see it from what they want. They see it from the way they want to see it. They see it from the way they understand, which then turns the problem. Many photographers come back and they spend this time on this story and they really, really work at it and they just they, they're like, okay, I'm doing this service. I'm, my photos have done this story service, and then it runs and it publishes, and it looks nothing like they, how they imagined, how they understood it. And that's because the person at the end of, end of the line there really didn't get it. Well, remember we tried to make a list of black and Hispanic photo editors? <laughs> yeah. And, um, it didn't take really long. It didn't. We, we, I think we hit less than 20 photo editors in the yes. United States, much less, if I remember correctly. It was much less. But we got and Hispanic than, photo editors, we couldn't hit 10. We couldn't hit 10. But we got over a booth. Because at first, when we started, and we were like, everyone could probably fit at a booth. We got bigger than a booth. We actually got to have a banquet table. Um, but still, it wouldn't pack this room. You know, at the same time, uh, there are so few... African American women photojournalists, yes. you know, working in newspapers. Lots of women working in art, in art and broader documentary world, doing important work. But if you look at newspapers, there are so few. Um, Achille Ramses from MPPA, who was one at one point, uh, says calls them unicorns <laughs> if she spots one, and she who would know. I think there's six. Literally, I'm not joking. But in the United States, she knows of six mm -hmm. African American women photographers, and she would probably know. She's the head of uh, National Press Photographers Association. Mm -hmm. When you were working in D.C., um, was this something you were aware of that you thought of when you went out, or with the editors you worked with? I mean, I, I don't think it's just only African American women. I think it's just women in general. I mean, the industry, it's very thin. So, um, you know, I was telling this to you earlier, I remember like during for the world press, I mean, there was like 83,000 submissions and out of that only 15% were women. And out of that only 1% was from Africa and the 1% did not make it past the first round of during. So, you know, when we talk about diversity, it's, um, it's some a reality that I deal with every day because I'm often sometimes the only woman present. Um, but to me, um, again, it goes back to, you know, the actions that, you know, I keep saying this, you know, what are we going to do about it? This is, this is the conversation, yeah. you know. Um, so the reality is there. Uh, and everything, as I keep saying, everything comes back to education, you know. And I think there needs to be a question of, um, why isn't there diversity? Why isn't there more people of color? Why isn't there more women? And, you know, is this a matter of, um, you know, the opportunities are available or, you know, I, I don't know. There, there's many factors, but from my end, you know, even in interviews I'm asked, like, how is it being a woman in, in such a male-dominated industry? And a lot of the times I say, you know, it's actually to my advantage because I'm underestimated, but then I can go in there and take the hell out of a photo, you know <laughs> what I mean? Because they're like... No, she's just a little girl who's not going to get anything, you know. So, um, so through that, it's just, it has its advantages. But just as, you know, you need someone on the ground to document specific things, if they come from that place, you'll get a richer story. And also, mm -hmm. I feel that the female voice is needed in this because obviously we have a slightly different approach or a different perspective, you know. And this is, the question goes back to the industry, of why it doesn't support that, you know, and... So the, also there are certain situations you'll have access to uh, that men may not exactly. as well. Um, <clears throat> you know, it, it, when you look at the importance um, in my mind of uh, having diverse storytellers, you can certainly look at it and think of it in the sense of opportunity and, and fairness. But 
you know, I, I, I like to make the argument that you get um, much, much better journalism. The more, the more different people you have telling stories, mm -hmm. the better it is for the reader and the viewer. No, I mean, I, I just want to go back, like, um, I think it was like in 2010, I was, so we did this project. I, I was interested in how much uh, cultural perception had an impact on photography. So, you know, the background you come from, the culture that you come from, when you show up at somebody else's culture and country, how do you, you know, what is it that you're attracted to? So we did this, this program where we had uh, an exchange with German uh, photo students, with Ethiopian students. So we invited the German students to Ethiopia, and then we also sent the Ethiopian students to Germany. And it was really fascinating to see that uh, there is a bias that stems from your background. And, mm -hmm. and this also goes back to how you're educated as well. You know? and, and even, for example, uh, for the education system here in the West, these are the things that need to be addressed in the emerging talent as well, about having this culture sensitivity and also mm -hmm of understanding how to get that story, to, to get the full story. So through that project, I, I knew earlier on that you know your background does have an impact of how you shoot, just as when you edit, it also has an impact based on your background. So these are also like bigger components outside of just the market and the industry, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. yeah. Oh, no, I was gonna just double down that. Um, just because I know in journalism, for so much of the time, we're taught like, don't bring your biases, leave your biases at the table, leave your coming at this completely, or you're even, even kill, no one way, no sway. But like, we're human. We all bring our own elements with us when we go into office and go to work. We make a picture. Like, we bring some part of our experience with us, so we can't be completely unbiased to what we know and what we don't know. So that's why I hear that, and I'm thinking about editing. You, you bring your biases with you. Absolutely. You know, when you, when you look at representation, um, you know, I, I think the, you know, it's, um, while there's certainly this advantage for insiders, um, there is also, I think we'd agree, a place for outsiders mm -hmm. as well who are sensitive and knowledgeable of a situation. You look at Maggie Stieber, for example, in Haiti, she speaks Creole, she's worked there hundreds of times. She's not someone parachuting in. And in the reverse, you don't want to be, have you know, um, uh, black photographers in the United States only be assigned to photograph black folks. Yeah. You know, or Asian photographers only invite, you know, assigned to photograph Asian folks. Certainly they may have an understanding that's useful, but you need this full picture. Mm -hmm. But the problem, I think what you were saying is that there just wasn't, um, you know, there, well, actually what you were saying, Brent, is that there weren't the photographers who were being used, which is not to say that there weren't photographers, but they weren't being assigned. Exactly. Mm -hmm. No, but it, it's, um, I don't know, to me, it, it just, it goes all back to, um, as you said, like the more, diversity that we have, the more different perspectives that we're able to get, you know, on a specific place, you know. So even through that, um, you know, the the key thing for me, it, it just really goes back to, you know, the opportunities and also, especially from editors, you know, a lot of the editors don't make an effort to really know who's in that place. So for them, it's just much more easier to ship somebody over there. Mm -hmm. But then, you know, the cycle returns back, and then we're, we're back to this, you know, as I mentioned, this cliche all over again. So even for that, it just, it's, it's um, now I think is the time that this conversation is shifting mm -hmm. and needs to actually move even further, you know. So then what can we do? What can we do in the industry? What can people in the audience do? You know, how, how do they respond to <laughs> Uh, this question of how how stories are represented, how people are represented, and whether we're getting an uh, accurate view or whether we, we're repeating many of the same, as you were saying, cliched storylines. What are the actions, both like people in the room, people are in the industry, 
photographers, what do you think? I mean, what do we do? For, um, for me, when it comes to just the general public, what, what you all can do, just, just be aware. Just don't be afraid to call things out when things might seem just a little bit off. Just don't be afraid to raise that hand. You all have Twitter or Facebook or Instagram or Snapchat or I don't know what's the next thing. We're in San Fran, so there's something new. Um, but don't be afraid to, to bring that up. Bring, write that letter. Send that tweet. Just understand. My, the next thing that I want to do is be, be aware of who's making your, the pictures that you're seeing. Um, I know I love people who for the longest thought like, oh God, this is going to be so bad. Um, Essence Magazine, which does, is a publication for black people. Um, if you look at who shot their covers over the last year, with the exception of the last few months, it's been nothing but white men. And I brought that up. Um, and people were like, whoa, no, there's definitely a black person who shot that. I was like, no, no, it's, it's a white guy. He's, he's nice, though. His pictures are really good, but <laughs> it's way too many. Um, so just, just be aware of that. Read bylines. Check on Instagram. See who's making these stories that you're seeing. And look at the point of view that they're coming from. And maybe if something doesn't feel right, or maybe something seems the same way you've seen it for the umpteenth time, wave a flag. Tell someone. Throw it on Twitter. Bring it up. Bring that conversation around. Because that's the way that we start to create change. And, and if you're in the industry, with something that um, I was going to say we, I don't work there anymore, um, ESPN put in was the fact of the matter is that when hiring for any assignment, you must bring at least a woman and at least a person of color to, and then if, then wild card. Go you mean you to the editor. So the editor. if you're proposing a story to your higher up editor, yes. you need to propose at three photographers. Yep. At least one of them needs to be a woman. At least one needs to be a person of color. Yes. And that's a step that Bloomberg took yes. and that Nat Geo is doing though with one person. Mm -hmm. So that's a concrete step. Yeah. Um, we were also talking, you know, we recently, uh, a bunch of editors um, informally got together and we're trying to come up with um, best practices and how to, you know, how to, how to act, how to find people. And one of the ones we were talking about actually had to do with representation. Because the, the problem was that you get an assignment, you're in a rush, and you, so how did I, how did I cover this kind of story last time? Mm -hmm. You know, and that's, okay, that worked fine. Yeah. And you go and repeat that same way, right? Over and over and over and over. Right, exactly. And it may not be accurate. Exactly. <laughs> but, um, so the idea was that you, know, you stop and think if there's different ways mm -hmm. to cover that story. Uh, you know, what are the flaws in the way? You know, maybe you should be photographing different people. Yeah. Uh, but how do you illustrate that? Um, and then uh, the idea of seeking additional perspectives. You know, one of the keys here is, as you were saying, who is in the room making the decisions. And as we've learned at the Times, you know, if you don't have a diverse group of people in the room, when that happens, that's when really bad, stupid mistakes happen. Yes. Very but yeah, oh, I have thought. Like Pepsi commercials, good, yeah, good one. Yes, yes, yes. Um, I'm not gonna dig in on some friends, <laughs> Nat Geo, but um, but <laughs> over, <laughs> but overall, like that's once again, that's how that happens when there's not someone in the room to raise that hand to be like, hey guys, I know this is the race issue, and we have a lot of amazing photographers inside of color, but maybe we should give someone the opportunity to shoot the front of the magazine cover, just, just saying, you know, we try that. Or just find something that, an uh, image that might make sense. I'm not holding on to hard feelings about the race issue. I'm just holding on to hard feelings about the race issue. Um, but no, these, yeah. So, you know, it's interesting. We're in San Francisco, and the San Francisco Chronicle has done really well. Oh my God. They have a really diverse staff. You know, and Nicole Frug um, hired, and they've really been at the forefront. Uh, you know, of and because of that, when you look at their photographs on the front page, they have probably the highest percentage, mm -hmm. at least they were counting, of women yep. photographers. If because you, the 
you know, when Daniela's women photograph ca uh, counted who's on the front page and found that in most newspapers it was 15% women or 10% or 5%, then <laughs> what's happening is we're seeing the world through only men's eyes. Yep. You're not getting a good view. Exactly. Which leads me to the last thing that we talked about, which was m getting statistics, right? Is knowing what your freelance hiring practices are mm -hmm. and your hiring practices, right? Let me so. see. I'm, I'm and are there. you doing that? You're keeping a diary? I am. I am. I'm okay. keeping a pretty good, since my time at the New York Times, let me see. Where is it? I know where my, hold on, hold on, I got this. I do it old school. Like everyone else has like spreadsheets. I just write it down on a notepad on my, on my desk. Um, okay, here we go. Ooh, I haven't told anyone else this. You guys are in this. So for the entire first two, first month that I was at the New York Times, I hired a total of 37, I signed 37 stories. I hired 20 men, 17 women, and of between both of those, 13 people of color. And I know my, I know what my weak spot is because it's continuously my weak spot since the last time I did um, something similar, it's working with more women of color. I know that. And so now when I go into next month, I'm looking for that. I'm like, okay, who else can I work with? Who else have I not seen? Who else have I not tried? Who else do I want to bring out? And maybe it, maybe at this is this moment where I'm like, okay, you know what? My, my clutch person is always X, Y, Z. Let's, let's try something new. Uh, that's the only way we're going to get there. That's the only way we're going to start to see things differently. Okay, so um, it's an in-forum tradition to ask uh, all the speakers the following question, uh, which is, what is your 60-second idea to change the world? Don't feel any pressure at all. Oh, yeah, no. Um, uh, well, why don't we start with you, Ida? Oh, thanks. <laughs> I should have sat over here. <laughs> um, so what is my... 60-second idea for how to change the world. Okay. So I, I believe that visual communication should be a tool for a change. Um, a lot of times we think that photography is just an artistic expression or for the news or for journalism, but I do believe that um, the image, since it has the power to inspire, to educate, uh, to connect, and also a tool that... Um, for me, it's a way to also share the world together. So through that, I do find that, um, I always say, you know, visual communication for change is my ultimate goal in my life. Thank you. <laughs> so Brent, cha change the world. Oh man, you just completely <laughs> stole my, my answer. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, so um, I think overall minds, kind of rise that same that same parallel in a way i what we need to do is honestly create a space and create a zone visually where we're all understanding like at the end of the day we're all human we all love we all we all feel pain we all want the best for ourselves we all want the best for our families and building that thread if it's from visuals, if it's from the written text, if it's from whatever medium that you pick, just to build that thread that we're all human and we all want the same thing at the end of the day. So let's drop our decisiveness. Let's drop going in between if you're red state or a blue state or you're upset or because that way is happening. Take that all away. We're all human. We all love. We all have compassion. And have we got to... Whatever we got to do to show that and to pass that on, that's what we need to do. So. Okay, thank you. <laughs> See, better you went first. Okay, so um, for questions, we're going to line up in the rear. On the right, there's a mic. So. Uh, oh, hi. Just. Hey. Oh, there's people here. I haven't seen you all. Okay. Just so everybody knows, we'll only be able to take a handful. So if we can't get to them, find the panelists afterwards and you can follow yes. up with them. So we've got a few people. And a reminder to keep your questions short and ending with question marks. 
<laughs> Say question mark. Uh, first thing is thank you to the speakers. I'm sorry some, the third person wasn't here. So the subject was mostly about African American and African photographers, but you look at the audience here. Look at the scarcity of African American people. Mm -hmm. You use the term gatekeeper. What do the uh, participants here think about the scarcity of African American photographers when the subject is about them? And how can your organization increase the participation of people like African Americans? Obviously, it wasn't marketed to the community very well. And what are your thoughts about that? Let's see. Um, I'm going to go go on a limb here and try to cure racism. No, um, <laughs> I'm kidding. Honestly, what it is is it's all about reaching out and finding people where they're at specifically. Um, and just reaching out, and it's going outside of your bubble. Honestly, I think like so much of what we're doing um, to create diversity inside photography and everything in general is just getting people outside of their bubble, outside of sharing it with just the people you know, just outside of your friends, and reaching to some other, pass along to some people who might who might not know, pass along to, send it over to a community center, send it over to some operation that just deals with that address the audience that you want to reach. I think that's, for me, it's just reaching across that aisle, reaching out to, getting outside your bubble and finding new voices, new people to interact with. Thanks. I don't know, okay, all right. Hi, so I'm from Taiwan. I can totally relate with how um, our culture or our environment is misportrayed, sometimes not even by others, but by ourselves, by our own media. So my question is, what are the advices or the opportunities that you will give to young photographer who want to amplify their voice, amplify their influence? You work with young photographers? Yeah. No, I was wondering. <coughs> I'm, I'm trying to live your life. Right. Um, I mean, the, the key thing, especially when I, when I teach and what, what I always say is that, um, and I say this often, is that uh, a lot of the young photographers don't work on personal projects. You know, once you get caught up in making money, um, you kind of forget the personal projects. And the way that I teach is I say, you gotta do work for your stomach, you gotta do work for your heart. And the work that you do for your heart is your personal project. And those are the things that you feel passionate about that you want to share with the world, you know? So through that, um, and first of all, let's just be clear. If you want to be famous, you want to be rich, rich photography is not, it takes a long time <laughs> to get to a specific point. So you first have to understand why are you doing this? And also wh what is your purpose? So you need to find that out. And most of the time photographers get into it for the wrong reason, you know? So finding out what you want to tell the world, that's going to be the first step. And it takes time, you know, you have to be dedicated. It, it's, it will, you know, it's draining in every way process, every way that you can imagine. But if you stick to it, this is the whole point, is that you have to have sort of resilience in order to continue pushing forward, you know? So for that, it's like, it requires patience, you know, and it's not an easy feel, field to be in. Um, if I were you, I would go to Taiwan and share that story with us because, you know, these are key places that we don't have enough visual references, you know what I mean? So for that, it's, um, you know, it's, it, it takes, it's a long road. At the same time, it's the personal story, though, that will gain you recognition. Exactly. Yes. So... Um, Never do it because of money or, you know, mm -hmm. you, you have to feel dedicated to what you want to express. Yeah, and as an editor who hires a lot, um, when I'm looking through someone's work, I'm always looking for what do you care about? What is your voice? What, what are you passionate about? Even if that story that I have has nothing to do with what, their, what your personal story is about, I want to see that because I know who I'm dealing with character-wise and, what you, and what, you, what you really care about. And, that's, and the intensity and level of work you're going to show in that work lets me know that you can show that on the assignment I'm going to give you. Are you a student? Okay. Hmm? A college student. In photography? No. Oh. Good for you. Uh, no. <laughs> exactly. I was going to say. I was going to say good answer. Good answer. 
Uh, no, I'm not majoring in photography. I'm just really into street photography and promoting my own culture to let people know, not just for like others, but for also for our like other Taiwanese to know what our culture is like and what are the things that they take for granted and doesn't really respect or cherish. Yeah. So, so my advice to you is, you know, build a collection, build a portfolio, don't grab a bunch of images. And this is, you know, one thing that we talk about is that, you know, build a story. You know what I'm saying? Just imagine this as a book that you're you're telling us a story. So don't show us one sentence of that book. Show us all the chapters. So if you're really considering this seriously, you know, look at the great photographers of what they've produced and also across Asia, you know, Every part of this world, there is amazing stories that are coming out by photographers in these places. So be curious enough not to only look at the Western photographers or the Europeans, but look at all the photographers across the board and how they're putting together um, a set of images to tell us a story. Next. This is our last audience question. Aww. Hi. So <laughs> I kind of have a two-part question. I have one. So I teach media to youth, right? So mostly... Uh, youth in need, right? So what do we do to, with the class issue in, in photojournalism? It's a huge issue, right? So most of the youth that I teach aren't going to be able to, they can't afford a camera, they can't afford those things. So how do you, how are you reaching out as editors or people working in photography to <coughs> hire people from different classes? And then also, how do you break the issue of nepotism in photojournalism? It's a huge thing, right? You can say that you want to hire as diverse as you want, but essentially nepotism is what gets people jobs. Yes, I think historically who you knew um, was really important. Uh, I do think that's changing some, not as fast as it should be, but I see a definite um, shift in that. And uh, as far as education, I think that's profoundly important. It's something we were talking about today at Catchlight uh, is how do you support uh, not just uh, creating help helping photographers, people become photographers, but photography is also a profound medium just to uh, help young people uh, become uh, more confident, to learn more, to uh, understand their surroundings. And so I think that, you know, I don't know that it's on the editors per se, but it is on the community to support education programs. And I encourage you afterwards, um, right in front of you, uh, um, Lacey is sitting, and this is what she spent the last 20 years of her life doing community programs at ICP. Uh, and I think uh, along many of the things you're talking about, and while we didn't talk about class a lot, I think it's a critical question, uh, it, both in um, people becoming photographers, mm -hmm. but also just you need people from different backgrounds. And uh, too often journalists are coming from upper middle class backgrounds or wealthier backgrounds. Nothing wrong with that. You just don't want them to only come from there. Mm -hmm. You need people with all experiences. And so that's something we need to be conscious of, I think, uh, very strongly. Thanks for bringing it up. And thank all of you for coming. And thank you. Thank you.